it's uh, appreciate being in Boise. I live in the Salt Lake Valley, but Boise is, I think, one of the nicest towns west of the Mississippi. Let me show you a slide. This is Durkee, Oregon. Anybody been to Durkee? Anybody know where it is? Thank you. It's about 90 miles west of here. My father-in-law had a 2,000-acre cattle ranch there for 20 years. Went there twice a year. My kids had formative experiences there. I think this is uh, one of the most beautiful places on earth, as, as is Boise. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Tom. Um, I have to make a couple of disclosures. One is um, I'm a principal in a company called Pain Therapy Innovations and its subsidiary, Actony LLC. I will also disclose I have not received any money from them, nor do I expect to receive any money from them in the near future. The second item on the disclosure slide is even more important. Anyone here who prescribes narcotics for any kind of pain needs to read this Wall Street Journal article. I'm a practicing anesthesiologist, 32 years. I listened to Russell Tortnoy 22 years ago, and I listened to him say, High-dose narcotics are safe for non-malignant pain. How many of you in this room believe that? Well, I'm here to tell you they're not. Russell Portnoy is the one who set in motion the whole notion that we can use high-dose narcotics for chronic malignant pain. I met him 18 years ago at a meeting, and I asked him, Dr. Portnoy, what is the evidence that it's safe? And he rattled off a study it turned out uh, the study was uh, simply a, a, a handful of case reports. And in reality, there was no evidence. And what he failed to describe, disclosed to me and others at the American Board of Anesthesiology meetings was he was receiving millions of dollars for the promotion by Purdue Frederick, uh, Pharma, et cetera, to promote high-dose narcotics. How many of you know that in 2007, uh, Purdue Pharma was sued for $600 million and the executives were prosecuted for four felony counts and barely escaped going to jail because they misrepresented the safety of chronic, long-acting narcotics for non malignant pain. I beg all of you to read this Wall Street Journal article. Russell Portnoy describes in detail how he was wrong and how there was no evidence for what he presented, yet he set in motion a series of events that have killed thousands of people created addiction, and we have not effectively treated chronic non-malignant pain. Read the article. You'll find it stunning. The other thing he failed to disclose, and I, I've met him several times. I've been in many meetings. He did not disclose that he received not, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions of dollars. The American Pain Foundation, which has since gone out of business, was funded exclusively by pharmaceutical companies that manufactured long-acting narcotics. I never appreciated the conflict. I'm stunned that he would admit that he's wrong, and it was based on the thinnest of science. So please, please look at it. I'm going to share something now. And Don, Don knows this. Don was at a meeting with me two weeks ago, a colleague of mine, Dr. Faber, from Provo, who's a chronic pain specialist. He presented data that I found stunning, and it's counterintuitive and unexpected. He showed that you took patients who had been on chronic, long-acting narcotics sometimes for years, for years, and you took them off. And guess what happened? Oddly, they didn't get worse. They got better. They'd been on narcotics for years. They took them off narcotics, and they got better. One of the reasons when you're on chronic narcotics that they continue to take chronic narcotics is to prevent withdrawal. Dr. Faber's an outlier. He presented data that I think will be very, very soon substantiated by other studies. But we can take people who've been on chronic narcotics and get them off get them off fairly quickly and they get better. Their pain scores actually go down. Read the Russell, read about Russell Portman. You will, everything you see involved, <coughs> addiction, chronic use, habituation, was set in motion by Russell Portman. This is one of my favorite slides. I, I, I'm a kid of the 70s. I grew up reading The Far Side. You can't see it, it says, hey, say, what's, uh, what's that mountain going doing up here in that cloud bank? Um, I, I think it says in a humorous way that things are not always as they seem. And I'm going to show you things that are not in your realm of current thinking. I just told you a fairly radical concept that Russell Portnoy was wrong, finally admitted it, and that you can take people off narcotics who've been on for years and they get better. 
I'm going to show you some concepts. The, the message today here is chronic osteoarthritis of the knee is a debilitating disease, and it can be managed in a very cost-efficient manner. And in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to show you how we do that. I'm going to share some of our clinical experience, and I'm going to share with you where the science is going. And, and I'm going to share with you where the science must go if we're to avoid bankrupting Medicare. Um, oddly enough, nobody even knows where this expression comes from. It's not Hippocrates. It's actually now considered apocryphal of questionable origin. But I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with the concept. Do no harm. Do no harm. I'm going to show you a slide where we do a lot of harm. I I've been in the operating room for 32 years. One of the things that drove me to understand osteoarthritis of the knee is because it's debilitating, and I saw a lot of harm. In the operating room, I hear all the time from the surgeons, from the patients, you've got osteoarthritis of the knee. There's no cure. Let me know when you've had enough, enough pain, disability, immobility, and we'll replace your knee. A knee replacement is miraculous. Many people do incredibly well. Sometimes you trade one set of maladies for a whole different set of maladies, and sometimes they're catastrophic. When I was a young student at the University of Wisconsin, I was in a physics class, and this is one of those books that was on the recommended reading. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas S. Kuhn. This was written in 1962. Um, oddly enough, I read the book. I don't know why I didn't have time, but I found it fascinating. But one of the things Thomas Kuhn says that I've never forgotten, science is built on a series of bricks, and each brick is integrated, and each brick fits together. As long as those concepts continue to fit together, we build a wall of scientific knowledge. But what happens when a brick doesn't fit? We have, a, we have an idea that comes along that doesn't fit into that brick wall. Well, of course, we discard it. It doesn't make any sense. This can't possibly be true. Who here knows the cause? What, what's the cause of peptic ulcer disease? Who here knows the history of H. pylori? 1982, two interns, Perth, Australia. They present data. Peptic ulcer disease is caused by H. pylori. Well, that's impossible. The stomach has got a pH of 2.1. It can't support bacteria. That's it. When they presented their data in Perth, Australia, they were laughed off the stage. They were laughed off the stage. They were ridiculed. Who can tell me what happened 23 years later? Warren and Marshall, they won the Nobel Prize in medicine when after being laughed off the stage. The brick didn't fit. It's not their fault, it's our fault. Our minds don't allow us to wrap our head around a brick that doesn't fit into the wall of science. What's the scope of the problem? Well, uh, it's massive, it's debilitating, it's expensive. 40% of people over the age of 65 will have osteoarthritis, 750 million people worldwide. In 2012, we did 719,000 total knee replacements. Let's just say it was $30,000. You, you can go to Malaysia, you can go to India, you can have a boutique uh, flight in and stay in a nice hotel, have your knee replaced for 12,000, maybe 10,000, 30,000 in this country. In 2030, six, 15 and a half years from now, we're gonna replace 3.5, these are primary knees. These are not redos. These are not people who failed and broken and had osteolysis. These are primary needs. You know what 3.5 million, it's $400 billion in 16 years. These young, the young physicians, are, we're gonna be around to see this. Greg and I will be dead, but you'll be around to see this. Can we afford that? The unfunded Medicare liabilities going forward for my generation that's starting to retire is $70 trillion. That made no sense to me until I looked at the knee. Well, of course it's gonna be $70 trillion. If it's gonna cost half a trillion to replace primary knees, $70 trillion is probably conservative. Uh, yeah, enough said. <laughs> causes, uh, what causes osteoarthritis in the knee? Well, everyone, it's just assumed it's wear and tear. Um, the more active you are, you, you are a football player, you're, uh, you're gonna be at risk. Well, it turns out being a football player isn't a risk factor unless you damage your cartilage. Being a runner, runners actually have a lower rate of osteoarthritis. Why do you think the pounding? Well, in reality, the pounding is, is actually less intense because they spend a certain amount of time in the air. But the exercise produces more synovial fluid, produces some lubrication in the joint. And as long as they don't have a big osteochondral defect 
or damage to a meniscus or an ACL that causes instability, runners are at actually lower risk of OA. So it kind of shoots a hole in the notion that wear and tear is what causes OA. It's not. Well, age is not. If you live long enough, you're going to get OA. Obesity, constant pounding without the benefits of exercise. Obesity is probably the single biggest risk factor for uh, osteoporosis in the knee. It loads the joint. It doesn't necessarily produce any of the beneficial aspects. Hereditary is huge, uh, primarily because of mechanical defects. If you have a valgus or a varus knee, you're more likely to load the medial and the lateral side. The knee compartment creates problems. Repetitive stress. Repetitive stress if you damage the cartilage. Yes. And why? Because of interleukin-1. The principal driver, it's now well understood, the principal driver of osteoarthritis of the knee is interleukin-1. How many of you knew that? How many of you just thought it was wear and tear? Hey, thank you. It's interleukin-1. And that's, that line of evidence comes from uh, some very, very good evidence. All right, you, you all know this slide. How, how many are primary care physicians? Any orthopedists in the room? Any pain specialists? Physical therapists? Um, <laughs> listen, you, you all know this. This is a busy slide. Um, we, we all know, the physical therapists know, if, if you take someone with OA, they develop a pain cycle, they stop exercising. Well, if you can get them moving again, they do better. If you can build some muscle mass, they do better. To a point. To a point. Uh, NSAIDs and acetaminophen. Um, can you take NSAIDs every day for the rest of your life and expect to live a normal, long, healthy life? Some can, most won't. Who whack your kidneys? Uh, Tylenol. Who can tell me the leading cause of acute liver failure in this country? It's, it's a loaded question, but it's acetaminophen. It's stunning. McNeil Labs has gone out of their way to convince you that acetaminophen is as safe as taking M&Ms when you have the flu. Now, for this year alone, the, the FDA has finally mandated we're going to stop making Loratab. Because there are patients who don't get the fact that Loratab is coating, hydrocoating, and Tylenol. So, well, I'm still having pain, I'll take some more Tylenol. Before you know it, you're over four grams, and you're dehydrated, and you get the flu, and you whack your liver. President Bush won his, his press secretary, got the flu one day, took Tylenol, had a couple glasses of wine, and went into acute liver failure. You need a liver transplant. Did he know that Tylenol was the leading cause of acute liver failure? No. Oh. Anybody do synthesis injections here in your office? Motor oil, hyaluronic acid. It's effective. If you have mild osteoarthritis, it's effective. Costs about 1,100 bucks, up to $1,500 a shot. Insurance will pay for two a year. It's not curative, it's temporizing. The disease progresses, inevitably progresses. Cortisone, cortisone, you want to accelerate osteoarthritis? Have a cortisone shot in your knee. You'll feel better for about two weeks, and then your knee is going to, you're going to go down the inexorable path of osteoarthritis, and you're well on your way to a knee replacement. Have it done three times in a year, and you've completely devitalized the cartilage. Orthopedic surgeons do it because those patients are well down the path to total knee replacement, and they don't care. The patient's going to have his knee replaced. We're just trying to keep him comfortable, keep him active. Knee arthroscopy, you probably read in the literature, well, knee arthroscopy is incredibly useless. Well, it's, we do a lot of useless knee arthroscopy, but I'll tell you this, if you have a meniscal fragment, you have a loose body, you have a plate band, it's in your knee, you are accelerating the rate of osteoarthritis. It creates chronic inflammation, it, it raises levels of interleukin-1, and accelerates the disease process. So even though acutely they go in and do these studies, it doesn't do any good to go in and wash out the knee it probably is protective of the knee. Realignment osteotic, if, again, we talked about hereditary. If you've got a valgus or a varus knee, we want to do what we can to enhance alignment because we don't want to unduly unload the medial and lateral compartment. Some people do quite well, just with a wedge osteotic. We actually go in and take a piece of the bone out and try to align the knee. And it heals, it heals nicely. They, they do, many of them do very, very well. Uh, support an unloading brace. Unloading braces help a lot. We have medial or lateral pain, you put an unloading brace on. What's the downside to an unloading brace? It weakens the muscle. We're doing everything we can to strengthen the muscle, keep them mobile. We unload the knee, we, uh, we also unload the quad to some extent. We weaken the knee, we weaken the musculature. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about biologics. Um, we are in the golden age of biologics. I heard a couple of my colleagues talking in the back about things that we do to damage our health. And one of my favorite sayings is, 
Gosh, if I'd known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. I have many, many patients come to me and say, I wish I had done what you recommended five years ago. I wish I'd taken better care of my knee. I wish I had understood that mild osteoarthritis is putting me on the road to a knee replacement. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. If you live long, if you're active enough, we can turn off that process at a nominal cost. That's a stunning thing to say. And it's absolutely true. It's borne out by our clinical experience. It's borne out by clinical experience all over the world. It's not widely accepted in this country. And it's a radical notion. So was H. pylori. So was H. pylori. Electrotherapy. Electrothera this, this lecture is called Electrotherapy and Biologics for Osteoarthritis. Because electrotherapy is now part and parcel of biologics. I'm going to show you why electrotherapy works. I'm going to give you a brief history of the devices and what we can do to stop the osteoarthritic process. And of course, the ultimate treatment for osteoarthritis is a knee replacement. I, I, I treat over a dozen surgeons personally. Two of them are joint surgeons. None of them ever want their joints replaced. What does that tell you? It, it's, you know, would they ever share that with a patient? Like, this is what I do every day. I don't want to replace my joint. I want to do everything I can to prevent the joint replacement. That, that's a stunning thing that is not, it's inside knowledge. Who remembers Vioxx? Does anyone in the room remember Vioxx? How many, 60,000 people died because of medicine. And said, the new generation of medicine that was going to protect the stomach turns out to accelerate heart disease. Who knew? Who knew? First, do no harm. We can go on and on. The, as I said, knee replacements are an astounding medical innovation when they go well. The Australian registry showed that 35% of Australian patients were unhappy with the result of their knee replacement. 18% in Canada. That's before you have to have a redo. That's before you get it. That's before things go south. That's before you get a DVT. That's before you get an infection. You almost never return to a level of function, range of motion, and strength that you had before your knee was replaced. I, I deal with patients every day who so wish I never had my knee replaced. Wish I'd never had it. Once your knee's replaced, you can't go back. You're done. You're committed to that new path. Commercial electrotherapy devices. Um, electrotherapy has had a very checkered history, and I'm glad we have a couple of physical therapists in the room because um, they're the first ones whose eyes glaze over when we show them an electrotherapy device because they know that TENS doesn't work. They know that E-STEM doesn't work. E-STEM stimulates a muscle. I broke my leg 10 years ago, and I, had, I went in, and I dutifully did everything they asked. In fact, I did five times what they asked, and I got better in a hurry. But they put E-STEM on my quad, and my quad functioned, they put e-stim and then they put ice. I said, what's the evidence that this is any good at all? You just stimulate my, my quad works fine. Why are you stimulating my quad? They, there's no evidence. There is, and I, I have a challenge, I have a $1,000 challenge to the physical therapists on uh, evidence-based medicine on the use of e-stim and ice, altering the outcome for anything. And uh, we can talk about that afterwards if you're interested. We're going to talk, everyone knows what MMES, neuromuscular muscular stimulate, so-called e-stim. The one device that's a game changer, this is an Irish company, Neurotech, they make a device called the NEHAB. It's actually a five, five electrode sequential neuromuscular stim device. It's actually quite a game changer. You have an ACL done, it actually capitalizes on the fact that the medial aspect of the leg fires before the lateral aspect. And they have a sequential program. It's shown dramatic results in res restoration of quad function after an ACL. It costs $1,800. When it first came out, the insurance company paid for it. They did well. Their own elegant studies showed this very well. No one will pay for it now. If I had my ACL done, I'd want one. I'd want something equivalent to it. I'd want it at home. I'd want to start it on day two. I'd want to do it three times a day. Doesn't happen. Bionicare. Anybody heard of the Bionicare? It's been around for about 30 years. The company's been through three bankruptcies. It started in Australia. It's microcurrent. It's direct current, microcurrent to the knee. It's now owned by VQ Orthocore out of Irvine, California. They've actually done some decent studies. They can show that they can delay the time to total knee replacement. $1,700. 1,500 hours of use. We see treatment fatigue when we ask people to treat 30 minutes a day. How much treatment fatigue do you think they get after 1,500 hours? It works. It works marginally. It's expensive. It has limited insurance coverage. You can go to their website, bionicare.com. Orthocore. Um, 
This is pulsed electronic magnetic field. It's been around for about 30 years. PEMF has been shown to have dramatic reductions on edema. Edema, little else. It doesn't suppress interleukin-1. It doesn't change meaningfully the outcome of osteoarthritis. There have been several companies, Orthocores out of Minneapolis, they're, they're burning through money at an incredible rate. Amp Orthopedics makes a PEMF. They're a subdivision of Avivi. They just went bankrupt. They had $9 million. They studied the shoulder and the knee. The results were terrible. They ran out of money, they shuttered the company. It doesn't work. It gives electrotherapy a bad name. It gives PEMF a bad name because it was the wrong indication. TENS doesn't work because we've used TENS indiscriminately. TENS was based on the Nobel Prize winning Melzack and Wall, where you simply stimulate a nerve, you, shut, you confuse the nerve, you confuse the spinal cord arc, and the pain goes away, temporarily. Temporarily. Then the pain comes back. Doesn't work. So why physical therapists? I said their eyes, I show them what we do, I show them our day and their eyes glaze over. It's TENS, it's EMS, doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. It doesn't work the way we've used it. Uh, I have to disclose Acumi is the company we've started. They pay me nothing. We, uh, it's a $265 device and I'll show you some data that is remarkable. We are, we have, we are rapidly assembling one of the largest online databases of a single, precise, reproducible treatment in the world. A year from now, we'll have over 1,000 patients and uh, an impressive data array. Here's the bionic here. It's a wrap. It's a wrap, some, some of them come with an unloading brace, some not, so they have a night wrap. You can wear it, you can wear it while you sleep. It's obvious, it's got a little, that, they say it's not tense. Well, it's tense. It, I, I read the original resource, it too came out of Australia. It's a tense device, it's a decontented tense device. They don't want to call it a tense device because nobody would use it, because tense doesn't work. It's a direct current, microcurrent TENS device, delivering current around the knee. Why? Why would you want to give microcurrent, microcurrent to the, an arthritic knee? Because 600 to 800 microamps, 10 to the minus 6, 600 microamps increases ATP synthesis. We throw tritiated thymidine into cell culture, we expose it to microcurrent, guess what? The cells divide. This is how the, the bionic hair works. It stimulates, it, it's somehow allowing what limited nutrient supply, oxygen supply, blood supply we have to the hyaline cartilage, it relieves some inflammation and it seems to enhance rehabilitation. What happens when you stop? When you stop, it all goes away. It just goes back to where you were. You've used it for 1,500 hours, you're wedded to it, you've developed treatment fatigue, you've gotten a little bit better and then you're wedded to it, and then it stops. Orthocore, here's a pulsed electronic magnetic field device. Incredibly, it's, a, it's got two pads. It runs the uh, magnetic frequency across, transverse across the knee. The, in this little compartment here is a, is a cartridge. You pay $600 for the Orthocore pulsed electronic magnetic field device, and then you have to buy a cartridge every time you want to treat. $7.50, every time you want to treat your knee for the device you just spent $600 for, you gotta buy a cartridge. I mean, it offends my sense of greed. This is the MP activity, Don Joy Global. Don Joy Global is a very uh, innovative company. They came up with, uh, this is alternating current, TENS. So it's useless. I, uh, I, was, I met a rep at an athletic training meeting last year in St. Louis, and uh, I was casually talking to him. He didn't know who I was. And I said, how, how's the, how are things with the MP activity going? He said, oh, not good. You know, insurance isn't covering it anymore. And, well, that's what, is it working? What's your return rate? Oh, God, uh, you wouldn't believe it. Our return rate's 45%. Why he would share that with me, I don't know. The MB active knee, people annoyed about a copay, the return rate's 45%. Well, obviously it doesn't work. Or if it works in a hand, it's no better than a placebo. Or... This is uh, Amp Orthopedics, which went out of business, and they, were, they put a magnetic loop around the knee. They stimulated it with uh, 27 megahertz pulsed electronic magnetic field, great for edema. Some pain relief, some transient effect on osteoarthritis, only to the extent that it was driven by edema. Nine million dollars, they went out of business. Uh, Avivi is the parent company in San Francisco. Interestingly, pulsed electronic magnetic field is now being used in head injury. And I'm sorry I missed the concussion story. The military is now funding Avivi 
to place pulsed electronic magnetic field generators in soldiers' helmets. To try, the moment a, a blast injury or head injury occurs, they're going to turn on the subthreshold PEMF. And it seems to prevent the, cas the inflammatory cascade without any serious side effects. Hastens healing, hastens recovery with a mild concussion as you measure these neurocognitive deficits, it hastens recovery. Hastens recovery. It's breathtaking. It could be a game changer for head injuries for sports as well as the military. Uh, again, this is the product we make, the pain therapy innovations make. Uh, it looks like a TENS unit. It's derived from a TENS unit. It makes people go cold. It's a precision wrap. We have four electrodes. We have a precise polarity-driven sequence of frequencies based on our proprietary research, and I will show you the clinical results. Embedded in it also is a, pulse, is a neuromuscular stem, so when you recover from ACL or meniscus surgery, we immediately put you on quad skin. Day one, you're on quad skin. You don't have to go to the physical therapist's office. You can do it three times a day. You can do it six times a day. So you're in a locked out position after knee surgery. We're stimulating your quad all the time. Our 2015 model will have microcurrent. We'll have 600 amps, microamps, that will be part of our platelet-rich plasma and what we call the nightfall program, where we can manage osteoarthritis, prevent the progression for less than $1,000 a year. What's changed? I just said that uh, electrotherapy has become its own worst enemy, which it has. Well, a couple of things have changed. Precise electrode placement. Electrode placement was done based on the individual clinician's best practice. There was little of it was based on science, reproducible studies, or multiple reproducible studies. Uh, there weren't good protocols. Every center had their own uh, approach. Uh, certainly my experience in, in Salt Lake Valley um, you, you get two physical therapists in your room, they have two different approaches. Uh, other than e -stim, when you're stimulating a quad or ham, hamstring muscle to get to contract and rest, TENS for pain is incredibly haphazard. Frequency sequence, and this is probably the biggest change. We found that the frequencies you deliver and the sequence in which you deliver and the total time over which you deliver them radically changes the outcome. When I look at a physical therapist and I say, listen, I can give you 24 hours worth of pain relief with a tens derived unit, it's laughable. Laughable. You agree, would you? Perhaps. Depends on the patient. I mean, if well, it works for some people, but it won't for others. And then there's the element of placebo. It certainly doesn't work for 90%. Very interesting your experiences. I, I was down at uh, in Salt Lake. We have Tosh. It's called the Orthopedic Specialty Hospital. It's a very prestigious orthopedic hospital. And I was given an audience with the head of head physical therapist, PhD researcher. And I started explaining to him what we do, explaining to him our data, and where it came from, how we're doing. And his eyes glazed over. And then he proceeded to tell me about a four hundred and fifty thousand dollars study that uh, the government was paying for. It's called Boost. Boost was to decide how much exercise was good and when you exceeded that exercise was bad for osteoarthritis in the knee. He didn't hear a word I said. Not a word I said when I show you our data. It's, it's stunning that he didn't hear a word I said. TENS works. For, we, we have a back divide. It's, it's not as successful. TENS relieves pain. The problem with TENS is you have to use it over and over and over again. And the notion that you can treat for 30 minutes and then a month later treat twice a week and have durable pain relief because we suppressed interleukin-1 is unheard of. It's not an accepted concept. It's a concept that does not fit in the brick wall of our current scientific structure. Uh, polarity, I get this all the time. Well, polarity doesn't matter. It's alternating current. Well, I'm here to tell you polarity matters. When, we, when we, we're oblivious to polarity, our device doesn't work. And there are a variety of reasons why, scientific reasons why polarity matters, even when it's alternating current. Um, our treat, treatments that are easily reproduced, you're seeing more and more positioning devices trying to make it easier for the patients to use. We try to make the box simpler. Even the most basic TENS device is complicated, especially for a geriatric patient to use. Melzack and Wall, as I said, they won a Nobel Prize. The gate theory of pain. It's important. It was a game changer. It's not that important now if you want durable pain relief and you want to suppress interleukin-1. Again, for us, the pain relief is a side effect. The pain goes away because we've suppressed interleukin-1. 
that one follows the other. We're not, we're not turning off pain and treating the symptom. We're turning off air looking warm. And microcurrent. My, microcurrent is uh, combined with biologics, in my view, is going to be a, a significant game changer. Uh, you, you probably know in what, February or March of 2012, the federal government withdrew all support for electrotherapy in the back. Well, the federal government commissioned six neurologists to study electrotherapy in the back, and they, they concluded that tense to the lower back is no good, no better than placebo. We're not going to pay for it. The government was paying up to $1,700 a year. They buy a tense device, they have a trial, you document its effect, efficacy, patient takes it home, they struggle with electrodes, they use it, they say it's useless, we're not going to do it. And they, they stop. And they're well on their way to eliminating other covered tens benefits now. It's had a chilling effect in the physical therapy community. Um, they don't cover any stimulation of a joint. Stimulation of a joint with a tense device is considered investigational. Part of it's because of bionic hair and orthocore trying to gouge the government and others uh, for in what was truly an investigational device. And I'll be the first to tell you, our device is investigational. I'm not sure insurance should cover it. I don't care if they do. It's so cheap. By the time you pay your co-pays and visits and, and doctor's offices, it doesn't matter. If you've got a high deductible, it doesn't matter. And again, I, the, the Zynex story. Have you any of you used Zynex stimulators? Zynex is uh, the only American designer and manufacturer and distributor of TENS devices in North America. It's based in Denver, Colorado. I was in the boardroom about a year and a half ago. It was chilly. The federal government is almost single-handedly going to put, put out of business a very innovative electrotherapy company because you can't sell beds and wheelchairs. We're not going to let you sell TENS units to the federal government. They're out of the Medicare business overnight. Overnight. Biologics. Does everyone know what PRP is? Anybody not know what platelet-rich plasma is? So we draw, we take 60 cc's of blood, we spin it down. The, one of the reasons for the highly varied results is that there are, two, there are different types of centrifuges. One stage, two stage, different levels of uh, concentration. But platelet-rich plasma, we take that buffy coat, and it's all mechanical, mechanical effect, and these platelets, when they degranulate, contain growth factors, a half dozen growth factors. And these growth factors help regenerate tissue. The best data for platelet-rich plasma is in soft tissue, tendonitis. Colonel and Job in LA has probably got the best outcome with chronic tendinopathies of anyone in the country. The data for osteoarthritis in the knee and other joints is complex. It's complex for a variety of reasons. It's complex because of the various methodologies. It's complex because of the dosing, the cycles, how many injections, follow-up. I'm going to show you that the person with the best results in the world is Peter Welling in Dusseldorf, Germany. Peter Welling treats the Pope, Alex Rodriguez, Kobe Bryant. Why do they pay $12,000 flying to Dusseldorf and spend a week to see Peter Welling? Because it works. What he does, he takes platelet-rich plasma and he manipulates it. If you take platelet-rich plasma out of the body and you manipulate it in any way, it requires a new drug application. The FDA requires you to show that it's safe. Well, they don't require that in Germany. And what he does, he does two things. He heats it, and he runs it over a glass column. In so doing, he removes all the interleukin-1. And he enhances, the, during the degranulation process that invariably comes when it's in the joint, he enhances the degranulation and release of growth factors. So now we have growth factors, dilute stem cells, no interleukin-1. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. I don't want to pay $12,000. I never want to have my knee replaced. I'm going to show you how you can do this for $1,000 a year. Interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. This is a, the holy grail right now of osteoarthritis research. In Thomas Kuhn's day, the, whole, the currency of science was a scientific publication. Darwin held on to his notion for 24 years. He only published because Wilson was going to publish his thoughts on evolution. He and Wilson and Darwin published almost together. There was no money involved. There were no patent applications. It was the prestige and respect of your colleagues in advancing scientific knowledge. Unfortunately, in, in our time, the scientific journal has become secondary. The currency of science in America, in the world, is the patent application. I've learned more reading patent applications than I have reading scientific journals, and I consume both with unbelievable vigor. I read it first in the patent application, because the moment someone has a, a new idea, they want to protect it. And it doesn't matter whether it's the University of Utah. The University of Utah has an entire campus dedicated to intellectual property. 
Somebody makes a discovery, they're not running to pre present it in the latest journal of cell, they're <laughs> running over to the campus to protect it and protect any manipulation, anything they did that they can commercialize and sell. Yes, to be true, they're advancing the scientific knowledge, but they want to protect their intellectual property. Biomed Biologics, I'll show you a patent application in a minute. M Site Biologics, they're, they're doing a massive study with uh, James Andrews down in Florida, one of the most famous orthopedists in the country. They're, they're funding $250,000 on NFL football players. Who, about 40% of NFL football players, by the time they hit 40, guess what? They've got osteoarthritis in the knee. They've had chronic, chronic trauma. Uh, they're heavy. They're at constant lows, ACL tears, meniscus tears micro cracks in the hyaline cartilage. What m is doing is they're trying to determine, does platelet-rich plasma help? And I have something very interesting to share with you at the end, this was just published. And the answer is it does, and it helps at relatively low cost. Lack of meaningful data. The lack of meaningful data for PRP, as I've said, it revolves around frequency, the quantity, the quality of the centrifuge, much of the literature, in fact, I'd say 85% of the literature on PRP, intraarticular PRP, is done outside of this country. It's done in Southeast Asia, who, who knows why? But it's done and it's very good, and it's evolving. And it's the few, I, I can guarantee you, if you have monoclonal to moderate osteoarthritis, you wanna be looking into PRP, and you wanna be looking into everything you can to stop the process now. If you don't, you're headed down the path. This is what we talked about. This is uh, an article about P Dr. Peter Welling, a very innovative, forward-thinking orthopedist in Dusseldorf. He's, he developed the notion of manipulating PRP to suppress interleukin-1, to enhance the release of growth factors, and to enhance the rehabilitation of the knee. Um, I have several patients who've been to Dusseldorf, and they've done well, but after about three years, it starts to wear off. They don't want to spend another twelve thousand dollars to go to Dusseldorf. So what are my options? So these are your options, and they do well. And in fact, we believe our data is as good as Professor Wells. As I said, this Thomas Kuhn would be rolling over in his grave. This is a patent application from Biomed. This is on interleukin one receptor antagonist rich solution. This is how to get an interleukin one receptor antagonist into the joint and make it stay there. Because we, we said at the beginning of the talk, interleukin-1 is probably the principal driver of osteoarthritis. If you can turn it off in the early stages, you're gonna do well. But there's gotta be a vehicle, and there's gotta be a vehicle to keep. Did they publish this in the scientific journal? No. No, they published, published it in a patent application because they wanted to want to protect it. Um, it's the currency of science. Dar Darwin and Darwin would be rolling over in his grave. But this is uh, the most important thing you're gonna learn today. There are a variety of ways you can suppress interleukin-1. As, as I've shown you, told you, Peter Welling manipulates it, which is not allowed in this country. He heats it, he runs it over a glass column. Uh, a lot of our proprietary technology grew out of literature I read recently, within the last five years, in the Chinese medical literature. The Chinese can suppress interleukin-1. They take one of the most painful operations we do in the body, uh, an open thoracotomy. As I said, I've been in the operating for 32 years. A thoracotomy where we cut out a lung, I trained at the Medical College of Virginia. We had four ORs dedicated to thoracotomies because everyone smoked. Four ORs for thoracotomies for lung cancer. It's an incredibly painful operation. Well, the Chinese looked at levels of interleukin-1 in thoracotomies. They're sky high. It's part of an inflammatory cascade. They stimulated an acupuncture meridian with a certain frequency. They suppressed it to zero. They suppressed interleukin-1 to zero by sim simply stimulating an acupuncture meridian after one of the most painful operations we do. It's stunning. That has created a whole line of research. We have exogenous suppression of interleukin-1. We have Biomed trying to find ways to get interleukin-1 antagonists into the joint. And we're trying to find ways to, if you can durably suppress interleukin-1 without side effects, you can turn off the operating process in about 75% of people. It doesn't cure everyone, and Peter Welling well knows this. There are people that do not seem to have an interleukin-1-driven disease, whether it's rheumatoid factor or others. We cannot cure everyone. We can cure an astonishing number. This is the coups. This is the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome score. It's, uh, it's been around for about 15 years. It's a highly validated metric. It's well-respected. 
It's a little different than the Ontario uh, knee score that many of the physical therapists are familiar with. It's actually designed for a patient who's slightly more active. Uh, there are 30 or more questions, it takes about five minutes. You end up with a score between 30 and 80 at the bottom right hand corner. It's all done by computer. We do online data capture. Every time we sell a unit, we try to incentivize the patient to fill it, take the K test before you start. Take it in four weeks. We'll, we'll help you. We'll give you a discount. Online data capture is what is going to allow us to collect one of the largest databases of a standardized electrotherapy treatment for the knee on the planet. And we'll do that in the next year. We'll have over a thousand. This is our data. And again, I'm not paid by the company yet. Uh, and I certainly am not paid millions of dollars and I'm not selling narcotics. Uh, I'm selling a device that causes no harm causes absolutely no harm. So here we have patients down around, 30 is pretty low. You know, a patient might be around 50, 60, mild to moderate OA. In six to eight weeks, they're in the 90s. These, this is real data. This is uncomplicated OA. This is someone without a torn meniscus, without a torn ACL, or if they've had a torn meniscus, it's been repaired. It must be repaired. If the meniscus is torn, if there's a loose body, if there's a plica, it will not work. It's constant irritation that the body cannot suppress. This is meaningful data, it's real. It is held with in high disregard because it's not randomized, it's not double blind, it's not placebo controlled. Let me tell you what it costs to do, to do a study with, a, with a, an IRB, an institution review board, and all the controls, safety of the patient, record keeping, $4,000 a patient, $4,000 a patient. I could spend $40,000 and have a very, very small number, and then I'd be accused of the tyranny of small numbers where it's not meaningful. I'm not gonna spend $40,000 to prove what we already know works. That actually puts us at some commercial disadvantage. But the moment we prove scientifically what we do works scientifically, now we're in a position of protecting our intellectual property. Other people will rush to do what we're doing. But I'm gonna show you some other things. What, what is the efficacy for electrotherapy and platelet-rich plasma? Our coups data. Non-randomized, non-placebo control, you can dismiss it. You can dismiss it, it's not science. It is 60% of it's captured online, the other 40% I capture personally myself. I hound patients, I call them, I beg them, I pay them to take the test, I pay them to send in the data. The other thing that convinces me, us, that the data is accurate is the patient satisfaction. Our patient satisfaction, our testimonials, um, have exceeded our widest, wildest notion. When we started this three years ago, we expected the return rate to be about 70%. We expected it to mirror what Professor Wellman did. It, it hasn't been that case, it's been much higher. And the thing that has astounded us most is a low commercial return rate. And I'll be the first to tell you a low commercial return rate is not a scientific metric, but I'll also be the first to tell you it's not meaningless. When you sell on Amazon Prime an electrotherapy device for osteoarthritis of the knee, you sell to a sophisticated group, they're educated, they follow instructions, they are quick to return it if it doesn't work. After 11 months selling our device for osteoarthritis of the knee, our return rate on Amazon Prime is zero. It's not science. It's also not meaningless. And again, we're, when we have money to do a proper study, we will, and we will prove what we do, and we'll prove it with biological, we'll prove it with interleukin-1 assays and synovial fluid. We don't have any money to do that. We will eventually do it. The return of that, we take care of a lot of elite athletes, a lot of elite athletes, because they're looking for whatever they can. Athletes are highly disciplined. They follow instructions. When they start to get results, they never stop following instructions. They do incredibly well. We have triathletes who are told after meniscal surgery, ACL, bad osteochondral defects, you know, you're gonna be lucky if you can ride a bike. It's time to find another sport. One of our first beta patients four years ago, he's a Utah Highway Patrolman. He was told you're done. He had one of our very first units. He was on it for eight weeks. He ran his first triathlon up at Bear Lake. He called me and said, Martin, you know him doesn't hurt my knee. I said, God, you're pulling my leg. No, he's, we see it over and over and over again. And the thing we love about taking care of athletes is they, just as I said, they're disciplined. They do what you tell them to do and they want results. We treat a lot of physicians. We also have, we, there are six major orthopedic groups in the country that use our device. 
They distribute them right out of our office, and we combine it with PRP. Our results are astounding. One thing I said, it's ineffective for acute meniscal injuries. I cannot stress it. If you have a meniscal injury, it's not going to work. You can have an ACL, you can have a post-meniscal repair. It'll work. It will not work if there's an acute foreign body, a fragment, or a plank in the knee. And the role of PRP, I'm going to tell you a little bit in a minute. Our PRP, when you combine suppressive electrotherapy with PRP, there is a synergy that more than doubles the outcome result. This, this abstract I hear was just published several days ago from the, journal, the famous journal of, of KSSTA. It's Knee Surgery, Sports Traumatology, and Arthroscopy. And what they found, you, you, can, you can legitimately say I'm presenting limited clinical experience here. But this is a scientific study published in a prestigious orthopedic journal. And what they found was over a two-year period with two cycles of PRP and PRP alone, this is, there's no suppression of your loop in one year, they were able to suppress and manage mild to moderate osteoarthritis. The disease does not progress. We do not see the progression of disease in people who use this and go on maintenance. When I say maintenance, they might be treating twice a week. You combine it with PRP, they might be treating once a week. We see no evidence of disease progression. I had a physical therapist who went on one of our social media sites and he said, don't be fooled by this. This is just a Jedi mind trick. Well, it may be a Jedi mind trick because there's some evidence that what we do, we're stimulating portions by stimulating points on the knee, we're actually stimulating the periaqueous ductal gray of the brain. Release pain. It suppresses interleukin for one. And I, said, I respectfully wrote back to him, I said, if you've got OA of the knee, it's progressing, and you're, you're on NSAIDs and Tylenol and a loading brace, and you can't exercise, and suddenly in four weeks your pain goes away, and you're able to exercise and do quad extension and hands and, and run, do you care if it's a Jedi mind trick? It's a hell of a trick, and it works. It's not a Jedi mind trick, it's suppressing your loop in one. We know this, we know this. And Professor Welling knows this, uh, individuals involved in the biologics know this, and it is, Biomet knows this, Arthrex knows this, Ensite knows this. They're not publishing it because it's not in their financial interest to pu publish it. But you will see this in the next three to five years. The data will become very, very meaningful. That platelet-rich plasma combined with or without suppressive interleukin-1 therapy is highly effective. I can't say this enough. I, I cannot tell you how many patients I've seen harmed. I've harmed patients. I've harmed patients with general anesthesia. You do a total knee replacement, they develop a blood clot, they have a deep venous thrombosis and a throat to the lung, and they die. They die because they came in and wanted a knee replacement. I, it's haunting. I've never forgotten. I'll never forget the surgeon telling me over and over again, Martin, it's just the way we do business. We tell the patients, let us know when you've had enough. We'll replace your knee. We cannot spend $450 billion in 2030 and replace 3.5 primary knees. That's before we do the redos and all the ones that fail and all the, all the osteolytic lesions when the joint loosens because we weren't able to get the interleukin-1 into the space. That, that's why Byron and Smedley studied this. They're also trying to find a way to preserve the joint they just put in that's lice and bone. Do no harm. This is what we do. We, um, our knee device, platelet-rich plasma, nightfall. Our, our chief interest is osteoarthritis of the knee, preventing progression. We, uh, we treat mild to severe end-stage osteoarthritis. Just as Bionicare has shown, Bionicare has shown they, in many cases they can double the interval. They, they can prolong by a factor of two the time to knee replacement using the Bionicare device, direct current, microcurrent, 15 hours, 1,500 hours a year, they can delay your knee replacement. We think we can do it with 30 minutes a day. And we think we can do it with even less if you're willing to spend $1,200 and have three platelet-rich plasma injections every 24, 24 months. We have a back protocol. We have several other products we can't discuss because they're in the patent stage. Uh, people say, well, Martin, what, what would you do if it's your knee? I'm, I'm, I'm blessed that I've never, I've never had knee problems. Uh, People ask me all the time, well, the first thing I would do, if I had osteoarthritis in me and I see my primary care doctor, I'd get a physical therapy evaluation. For gait, for valgus, for varus, for muscle strength, what can I do to improve muscle strength? Uh, do I have a patella tracking issue? All these things are incredibly important. And they actually enhance the outcome for what we do. It's important, but you can't go to the physical therapist every week for the rest of your life. And there, there's, there are insurance limits coverage. The, uh, People have co-pays. I have one patient who paid $8,000 in co-pays trying to fix the ziliotibial band. We fixed it in three and a half weeks. 
And about once a year, it flares up a little bit, he treats again, it goes away. He saw one of the leading physical therapists in Utah. Physical therapist to the start. He's a physical therapist to the ATP World Tennis Tour. We have, we have the unit on the ATP World Tennis right now, and that professional tennis player is getting better. I would start with suppressive electrotherapy. You can do this in the art. You can sell it. You can go on our website. You can do, you can buy a bionic care for all I care. The first thing you must do if you're going to stop the progression of osteoarthritis is suppressive and lifting up. That, that's just the gold standard. It, and that's a fairly new concept. The next thing I do is PRP. If I could, if I could afford it, I do stem cells. I do stem cells on my iliac crest, and I do suppressive inter, interleukin therapy. I, we believe that the ideal treatment is suppressive electrotherapy and PRP. Orthokine is Professor Welling's exogenous, exogenously manipulated PRP. He's actually set up a clinic in the Caribbean. He's taking this thing worldwide. People don't go and spend twelve thousand dollars on something that doesn't work. They go and spend money because it works. He's developed a reputation. And the last is interleukin-1 receptor, a direct antagonist that's intra-articular into the joint. It's coming. It's coming. And it's coming in a, in a proprietary carrier vehicle. It's going to be enormously expensive. It's going to be enormously expensive. We might be praying to be total knee replacement. Uh, questions? I am. Uh, again, I love the far side. This is certain friend of mine suggested this. He says, unbeknownst to most historians, Einstein started down the road of professional basketball before a repetitive non-surgical knee injury diverted him into science. I, I know many orthopedists who want to be professional athletes that end up with an injury, usually a football injury, uh, to lay their careers. But um, anyway, thank you for your patience and your time. I've got a few minutes for questions. Don, how much time do I have for questions? No? Okay. Well, I think we got a few minutes. we got three to five minutes. Oh, come on, you gotta have a question, please. You talked about OAD and interleukin 1. I'm assuming that you're saying interleukin 1 is the driver of osteoarthritis in general, but you're talking about the knee specifically. My only interest is the knee. Right. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have enough experience or data to talk about the shoulder or the back. My, my personal feeling is uh, I used to be an interventional pain management specialist. We see a lot of facet disease. We do diagnostic facet blocks with steroids. We do median branch rhizotomies. We kill the nerve to take the pain away. I think we're not far off from injecting platelet-rich plasma, a tenth of a cc into the facet joint, rehabilitating it with electrotherapy. When we're no longer doing rhizotomies, we're actually rehabilitating the facet joint and, and maintaining full range of motion without nerve disruption. There's always a risk when you destroy a nerve, it comes back and it's very painful. You get a neuroma, all kinds of bad things. We're doing harm. Please. I just wanted to add my two cents. Please. Okay. Part of part of Dr. Mott's electrotherapy is suppressive and um, whether or not people are willing to do exercise on their own. Because there are Absolutely. people who would buy like those ab stimulators trying to tone their abs but yeah. they don't do anything on their own. That's right. So so these things don't work unless people do exercise. Precisely. And Precisely. continue. Not Precisely. Not. The, 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 as I said, the athletes are some of our best patients because they're so disciplined. The other thing we find, one reason we like to have the patients take the K-test, it's an objective measure. They take it four months later, four weeks later, I'm better. It motivates them to continue on therapy, especially if we can get them down to treat them three times a week. We, we, our, pain, our compliance is astounding, and one of the roles we believe it's so effective is because that patient can now treat easily at home, 30 minutes. The device is incredibly easy. We have videos, it's a single, our, our proprietary program is a single button. They set it and forget it. Our nightfall program is even easier. They're gonna put it on. So I'll play the first plasma injection, they'll put it on, and we'll see you in the clinic in six weeks. But compliance is a huge problem, and that's, that's why the government is withdrawing. Is it possible for a 70-year-old patient to put electrodes on her back and get any kind of meaningful treatment with a complex box that I barely understand? Of course not. Of course not. Please. So, so you have a recommended approach to so mid mid uh, OA of the knee, and then you recommend the platelet replacement and the device, or one or the other, or what? In other well, words, a standard patient that comes into your office, how would you? What would be your optimal the, recommendation? The, the first thing we do is we put them on electrotherapy because it's cheap. Right. Um, it's not covered, but it's cheap. It's two hundred sixty-five dollars. 
And the other thing, if it doesn't work for you, we're the only company in North America that does it. If it doesn't work, bring it back. We'll give you your money back. Nobody does that. As I said, our return rate on Amazon Prime is zero. In the orthopedic office where we treat a more severe level of disease and it's easier for the patient to return, the return rate's only 5%. If you're not getting the results we think you will get, bring it back. So the first thing we do is recommend suppressive electrotherapy. The problem with suppressive electrotherapy, many of them do well, the problem is platelet-rich plasma is expensive. Three, the, the best we can do, and that's hammering our cost, We'll do three injections for about $1,100. Some place in the nation, it's probably closer to $1,500, $1,600. Stem cells are $6,000, $6,000. So how do you go about the PRP? That, that's your own way. That's no, we, we use biomed technology. We, we have a centrifuge in, a, in an orthopedic exam room. We draw out 60 cc's of blood. The, the machine and the patient never read leave the room. We never want anything mixed up. Patient's there, centrifuge is there. We draw the blood out. We, we spin it right in front of them. We take about four cc's of the buffy coat, inject two into each knee or, or three into one knee, and we're done. And we'd like to do a series of three injections about 10 to 14 days apart. We put them on four weeks of suppressive electrotherapy, Acune, forgive me for counting my own company, which doesn't pay me, four weeks of suppressive electrotherapy, three PRP injections followed by suppressive electrotherapy, then we evaluate, we go on maintenance once or twice a week. Next year, we're starting the Nightfall Protocol where we'll use PRP, eight hours of microcurrent, two hertz, 600 micrograms. The results are very, very good. They're very good. Or you can go down the route, you can take NSAIDs, you can take Tylenol, you can exercise, you can pray. Because that's what it's gonna take, your knees are gonna get worse. If you can get, and the primary care doctors here, if you can, you're the first ones to see them. Mild OA, they come in, my knee's stiff, my knee's stiff in the morning. What can you do? Well, you're getting developing osteoarthritis, we're gonna send you to orthopedics. That's not good enough. I've, I've listened to this for 30 years. Let us know when you've had enough, we're gonna replace your knee. That's just nihilistic madness. And the madness aside, we can't spend 400 billion. 400 billion in a Medicaid, Medicare trust fund 